Good morning. The M case exchange has potential to redefine second opinions in medicine. And uh, this forum is designed to uh, highlight that technology. The M case is a technology that allows you to share uh, your own cases with your colleagues and elicit their opinions. Uh, and this video illustrates that. We are neurosurgeons. We believe our profession is more than just a career. It is a calling, and we are on call at all times, even when we are not. We care about our patients and their health. We want to do everything in our power to do what is best for them. We have trust in our instincts and our experiences, but we don't have all of the answers. So it is our duty, our responsibility, to both seek and provide advice. And while we may be separated by hundreds, even thousands of miles, the whole of our knowledge can help patients. Through the power of shared expertise, we can revolutionize healthcare, but we can't be stagnant. We must build on our rich tradition while embracing new technologies. We must continue to protect patients' privacy, and we must share our thoughts with others. After all, it's what you think that can have the power to forever change a patient's life. The MCASE Exchange was recently launched in 2015. It's easy and secure uh, method to share cases, and it provides international surgeon connectivity, allowing shared knowledge and expertise. Uh, it, it provides an opportunity to house a library of cases uh, for case-based learning. And uh, thus far, we have hundreds of members. And the more members we have, the more effective the application becomes. All CNS members have free access. Uh, it, it can be accessed by this website that you see here or by downloading the application through the App Store. Once inside the application, you see a, a screen that looks like this. There's a community selector that allows you to toggle among communities. There's a case filter uh, that allows you to uh, uh, see only cases of, of interest, for example, in your subspecialty, spine, vascular, tumor, or pediatrics. You're able to sort your cases based on time or relevance to you. It's simple to post a case. For example, you can press this uh, blue pencil icon in the corner. And you simply follow the prompts on the screen. Of course, no protected health information is allowed, uh, but it is quite simple. You take pictures right from your iPhone camera um, or from your camera roll. And it allows you to uh, quickly post a case. And subsequently after that, uh, community members have access to the case. They're able to comment on the case with their own uh, management opinions. And so prior to uh, this meeting, uh, we asked CNS members to post cases to the application uh, with the opportunity to have those cases presented on stage here with our uh, expert panel. And uh, so we'll move into that portion of this uh, uh, this presentation, and uh, we're joined today by uh, Dr. Nicholas Didor from Johns Hopkins, uh, Dr. Praveen Mumineni from UCSF, and Dr. Park from University of Michigan. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so these cases that I'm presenting, uh, or that we're reading to you now, were uh, taken right from the application. Um, and so these were CNS members who had specific questions about their cases. And uh, the forum here will be to answer those questions uh, with the panel. So uh, without further delay here, this is a case uh, posted by Dr. Shaw in Topeka. Uh, this is his title that he put up there, Dens Fracture with C12 Rotatory Sublux. And uh, this is his writing here. 90-year-old uh, man, status post ground level fall, neurologically intact with neck pain, lives at home with uh, minimal family assistance, 
reasonably healthy. He has great controlled AFib. Uh, MRI shows plenty of space available for the cord. Uh, there's a disrupted apical ligament, disrupted joint capsule, and uh, the transverse and alar ligaments uh, without stir signal. And uh, we are provided with this imaging, uh, CT imaging, um, where we obviously see a type 2 dense fracture. We see rotatory subluxation. And so in this 90-year-old uh, patient, uh, uh, the question is uh, how to most effectively treat. Um, so I'll, I'll turn this over to our uh, panel members for their opinion. Well, this is, um, you know, obviously a posterior displaced type 2 odontoid fracture with a little bit of rotation. Looks like there may be a C1 fracture posteriorly as well. You know, this is, these are uh, happening with increasing frequency, and I think these are some of the cases where, and unfortunately, you need to see the patient sometimes because he's living at home, he's independent, and um, depending on what his surgical risk is, it wouldn't, you know, would not be unreasonable to, to think about doing a posterior approach for a C1-2 fusion to not obviate the need for a long-term orthosis. We do know that leaving these untreated for a period of time, in some cases, they certainly can develop myelopathy. The converse of that being, if you know, the patient is too high of a surgical risk or uh, not, not deemed a suitable, suitable surgical candidate, we can do what, what I had usually called CFL or collar for life and put this person into orthosis and, and just manage them with serial imaging. Yeah, I think uh, important things to understand is uh, in the geriatric odontoid fracture trial, uh, not trial, but uh, study, it was pointed out that patients who have this pathology actually have a fairly high morbidity and mortality within a couple of years of having a fracture like this, whether you operate on them or not. The rate of mortality was a bit lower if you did surgery, but it certainly uh, was still significant on, in either cohort of that, uh, in that study. So uh, what we've got to consider is just as uh, Nick pointed out, your two options are continue in a collar forever or do a, a fusion. If I was going to do a surgery on this patient, I probably would do a C12 fusion uh, with a C1 lateral mass screws, C2 uh, pars or pedicle screws. You cannot do a sublaminar wiring because the back of C1 uh, looks like it's fractured. So uh, then you'd have to pack some bone into the facet joints in order to get the fusion and you'd have to realign C1 on C2 to do it. Best way to do that was, was with, with, with the screw rod construct. So I'd probably have to sacrifice the C2 roots, pack bone into the joint, C12 posterior fusion. This is going to have to be done prone in a 90-year-old who's already got AFib, and I can guarantee almost that once we put him prone and do a surgery like that, whether he's on amiodarone or not, he's going to have AFib, and then we're going to start thinking about whether we want to put him on Coumadin. So those are all the issues that it has to be discussed with the family, a high morbidity, high mortality potential, whether you're going to do a collar for life or whether you're going to do a surgical intervention Either way, the uh, patient's going to have quite a bit of risk. Yeah, I, I would agree with uh, uh, both Dr. Uh, Theodore and Dr. Mumu in, in terms of their uh, recommendations. Uh, the only, I think, caveat with this case, uh, we all, I think, see a lot of geriatric uh, odontoid fractures. It's pretty common in that age group. Uh, the only um, difference here is he's got a uh, rotatory subluxation component to it. I think if this were not the case, it'd be pretty straightforward. I, in my practice typically, I would just call them. They typically uh, develop a fibrous non-union. They're not that active. And, and generally, they do well. And I think there's some literature to support that. But again, uh, there is a little bit of a uh, difference here just because of that subluxation. And so um, a consideration of surgery, I think, is reasonable. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to the next case. Uh, this one uh, submitted by Dr. Levesque. Uh, aneurysmal bone cyst, and uh, he writes, a 55-year-old male with worsening lower thoracic back pain, imaging shows lesion consistent with ABC at T11 in left pedicle. Current plan is for lateral extracavitary uh, costal transversectomy with resection, curatage, and fusion, one level above and below. Questions um, include any role for biopsy beforehand? Uh, there was some question for, from uh, an orthopedic surgeon whether this could be anything else that would ne uh, necessitate a change in plan based on the biopsy results. Also, there's some debate in the literature about simple curatage, alcohol, cement, or et cetera, into the area of resection. Any thoughts on that? And uh, these are the images provided. Um, 
CT obviously shows a lesion at the left pedicle. This is T11 with the rib head there. Um, and here's the MRI. Um, and, and so a couple questions within that post, but um, you know, I guess management options, would you biopsy ahead of time? What uh, approach would you take for resection? I mean, it, the, the appearance certainly looks consistent with the uh, aneurysmal buses. It looks like there's a little bit of a fluid level in one of those lobulated uh, areas. You know, um, traditionally, the in larger ones, and, and you know, they, they, these are quite vascular lesions, and I guess one of the issues is the role for uh, preemptive embolization. And there's, there's some evidence to suggest in, in the pediatric population in some adult cases that that actually could be a primary treatment uh, for some of these lesions. Unfortunately, from a structural standpoint, the pain is probably caused by you know, erosion into that pedicle. We do have some instability. So it, it's probably from a, from a quality of life standpoint you know, going to be better to consider maybe embolization, resection of the lesion, you know, and then I don't think it needs an on-block resection, but a piecemeal resection and then, uh, and then stabilization. I think it's probably the, probably the best thing is his pain is from, you know, certainly destruction of the bone in that region. I don't know what you think, Praveen. Yeah, I think uh, that's all entirely uh, uh, reasonable. Um, you know, the differential diagnosis does include a giant cell tumor. It's likely an ABC. Fluid fluid level makes you think it's an ABC. Rarely you can get fooled. Uh, I don't think it would be terrible to have a needle biopsy done. Radiology may just get back blood and have no diagnostic tissue. But in the small case that it's a giant cell tumor, then your surgical plan might involve a more radical resection. But I agree with everything else. I think if it is an ABC that I would go ahead and take it out, wide uh, curatage, and get uh, you know a little bit of the bony fragment even that's touching the bone. Because even though it's called an ABC, it really does have a little bit of neoplastic component. You don't want it to come back. So having a little bit of marginal resection is not a terrible thing. And then stabilization, because it's taken out a pedicle. And once you get to it, you're going to end up taking out a facet as well, uh, I don't think is unreasonable. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I mean, if a lot of these ABCs are dorsal, and there's no stability component, then there is actually some literature on selective angio uh, embolization. Uh, it really, really requires multiple treatments, but it, it can potentially be um, very well treated in that manner. But in this particular case, with uh, how, how it's situated and the component of the facet, it, there's probably going to be a sp stability issue if this is resected. And so instrumentation is definitely, I think, necessary, probably with preoperative embolization, because these do bleed quite a bit. And uh, again, I agree uh, with Praveen that uh, intralesional resection with maybe a gross resection uh, would be the uh, best choice. And uh, if you do leave a little residual, um, I, I've treated some of these in the past and having consulted with our radiation doctors, uh, some of them do recommend uh, adjuvant radiation afterwards to minimize the recurrence rate. One, you know, I guess one final comment to Praveen's point. If you if you suspicious for giant cell, and there's certainly very little downside to getting a needle biopsy, I mean, that, that shows you where we've come with these. I mean, giant cell, I mean, part of the primary treatment now might be chemotherapy, right, with the most amount. So uh, if, you're, if you're suspicious and, and there's really no downside to getting the, you know, to getting the biopsy first, if it's getting, you know, in that case, it may actually help you if there's a question. I, I mean, I believe it's an ABC, but if, if, you're, if you're concerned or radiologist concerned, it's there's a little downside to getting a biopsy. Very good. Uh, this case is uh, presented as hardware failure, and uh, as an ex extensive history here, a uh, 70-year-old man, 6 foot 8 inches tall, uh, previously had an L3 to S1 decompression infusion with BMP in 2008 elsewhere. He presented with chronic low back pain, radiculopathy, claudication. Imaging showed an L3-4 pseudoarthrosis, uh, hardware failure, flat back and L23 adjacent segment stenosis. Uh, there is a pelvic incidence uh, lumbar lordosis mismatch of 25 degrees, uh, uh, sagittal vertical axis of positive 12 centimeters. Um, so um, Dr. Sweeney took this patient for L1 to 4 Smith-Peterson osteotomy and T11 to L4 fusion with T10 and T11 cement augmentation. Uh, with uh, screws, cobalt chrome rods, um, and uh, fusion. Uh, the patient had a, a fall between visits, and then at three months postoperatively, the patient had uh, some back pain. And um, so I'll show the imaging in just a second, but Dr. Sweeney asks, 
um, for opinions on would you extend the construct up to T4 uh, with BMP or would you perform lateral inner body fusion and just revise uh, posteriorly at the same levels? And then he asked also, would anyone do a pedicle subtraction osteotomy up front uh, or at this point after the patient has hardware failure? And uh, to go through the imaging here then, um, this is the uh, preoperative imaging. You can see the previous L3 to S1 fusion. You can see that there's uh, pseudoarthrosis at 3-4 and stenosis. Um, at the level above. You can see that the patient has uh, flat back and positive uh, uh, sagittal balance. Uh, so on the left of your screen there, you can see initially post-op, uh, the patient has uh, more optimal alignment. Um, and then on the right, you can see what happened three months later with hardware failure with pull out of the rods. And so the question becomes then, uh, how would you revise this? Would you extend levels up? Uh, would you uh, go from a lateral uh, uh, approach? Or would you consider a uh, more extensive osteotomy? Is running away an option? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I, you know, this, I mean, this poor gentleman's unfortunately undergone multiple procedures, and, and, you know, at this point, I think you're probably going to need to think about doing something definitively, which is extending him up to, you know, the upper, higher thoracic region. I don't know that you have much of an option. I, you know, it's not a lethal process in most cases, and I think that's a long, I mean, we've we got hardware failure. We've watched, certainly watched patients who are not absolutely an extremist with this problem, and, uh, I mean, that's, you know, again, that's a, that is an ongoing discussion before you rush a 70-year-old back into their fifth operation. I'm curious, Praveen, any MIS options? Yeah, this is, this is a, a problem on many different fronts. The number one problem here is that the modulus elasticity of cobalt chrome rods in a 70-plus-year-old male is probably way too stiff for someone who's got likely osteopenia. My first step would be to get a bone density study if he's got a terrible bone density, which would purport, even if you stopped at T4, again, the screw's pulling out, I'd probably treat him with teriparatide. Now, say his bone density is okay, then we're going straight to surgery, uh, then I would probably consider T4 or T3 as a stopping point. I agree with Nick. And he has inadequate lumbar lordosis for his pelvic instance. His PI is really quite high. His lumbar lordosis looks relatively flat. Plus, you have Smith-Peterson osteotomies in the back. And across those osteotomies, I don't see any bone bridging. So we're probably going to need to do a lateral, put in some inner body grafts. Uh, and then he probably will need a pedicle subtraction osteotomy. I would like to do that at L3, uh, maybe an extended PSO up into L2. And then basically you take out the 2, 3 disc. We can put in either a soft autograft there or a cage and cantilever over the cage. That'll give you about 30 to 40 degrees of sagittal plane correction. And then um, we can plug the other uh, gaps as necessary with either T-lifts or laterals at 3-4, uh, uh, at 1-2. Uh, I usually don't do laterals any higher than that, but I think if we do a 1-2, maybe a 2-3 uh, T-lift with the PSO, and then a 3-4 T-lift, if we're trying to do it all in one stage, extending them up to T3, uh, T3 T4, we'll probably give them satisfactory lordosis. I would consider this time around not using cobalt chrome rods. I would consider using titanium rods just because they're less stiff and maybe using a hook construct up on top to prevent this thing from pulling out again, you are going to get correction of that thoracic flat back. Uh, once you have more lumbar lordosis, it's a compensatory thoracic flat back that's going on up there. So I think you'll be able to reasonably get them back lined up. But I think the first step is a bone density study. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I mean, it, you know, you need your, if you're doing deformity surgery, you're dependent on the bone quality. So if they're osteoporotic or osteopenic, it's a real issue. and. Uh, you know, Fortail, like Praveen mentioned, uh, has been shown to be very helpful in this regards. It's, it's sort of an interesting film. If you look at the left panel between L2-3 and, and 3-4, uh, on the panel to the left, you can see they did the Smith-Peterson osteotomies and got good compression. And uh, the right panel is a little bit misleading because you, your eyes kind of follow the, the fact that the rods came out of the screw heads at the top of the construct. But as you can see, they lost the compression there at 2-3 and 3-4. Whereas before the segments were lordotic at the disc space level, now they're, they're horizontal or mildly kyphotic. So uh, as Praveen mentioned, I think uh, a lateral approach, and you can do multiple inner bodies here all the way up to 12-1 even, 1-2, 2-3, 3-4, to give some anterior support. Uh, 
and going back and just compressing maybe 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 a least invasive option uh, beyond doing a PS PSO. The alternative is depending on where the great vessels are, an anterior ligament release or, or anterior column uh, reconstruction would be a viable option to avoid a PSO. Um, uh, but uh, really, I, I think he's probably going to need something right. along those lines. Certainly an interesting case, complex case, that uh, where multiple opinions come in helpful here. I might add one more thing is if this is going to be taken up to T3, I would put an iliac fixation down at the bottom because the next failure will be a distal junctional uh, sacral fracture potentially. And with that, um, I'd like to thank our, our panel for participating. And um, that's all. Thank you.